Well, I'm so honored to be here. My name is Tracy Lauer, and I am the Chief Storytelling Officer for Anheuser-Busch, or as most people know it, Budweiser. Um, I've been with Anheuser-Busch for 18 years, so I tell people I started when I was 10, uh, just to make things easier. And I'm really proud to talk about our company's history. Today, what I'm hoping to do is to give you a little bit of background first about our company, um, then I'm going to be reviewing two case studies, one of how our company used our history in a local example, and then, of course, going through a global example, which you'll be a little bit more familiar with. Um, then I'm going to give you a brief overview of our department, and then, of course, our plans for the future. But first, I wanted to show you a television commercial. You don't look like you're from around here. Welcome to America. Welcome to St. Louis, son. Beer for my friend. Thank you. The next time, this is the beer we drink. Never had an Isa. Dolphus Bush. Well, this commercial aired on Super Bowl Sunday and was watched by more than 20 million viewers, and it garnered more than 3.5 billion media impressions. Um, although this is a very highly dramatized version of our company's history and story, it's really our most recent example of how our company used its history and how our history was in the forefront of everybody's um, television screen. But to fully understand the history of Anheuser-Busch, you really have to take a trip back to St. Louis in the 1800s. The population of St. Louis was 8,316 back in 1835. Between 1835 and 1845, our population doubled every five years. There are over 20,000 Germans that landed in the city of St. Louis. By 1850, our population was 77,800, with one-third of our population being Germans. Germans flocked to St. Louis for a variety of social, economic, and religious reasons. And of course, the large German immigrant population really led to the establishment of breweries in St. Louis. St. Louis was very well suited to becoming a brewing town. We had a lot of natural um, ingredients that were available in the area. We have caves that formed in the area, um, which were very necessary for creating lager beer. Um, we also had the ready source of ingredients like water. We have a lot of rivers in the area, so it's a perfect ingredient for beer. And of course, we had that demand from the German community. In 1854, there were 24 breweries. By 1860, that number had grown to 40. And by 1867, there were 53 breweries in St. Louis. A lot of people think Anheuser-Busch was the only brewer in St. Louis, but we had 52 other competitors. George Snyder started the Bavarian Brewery back in 1852. In 1860, Eberhard Anheuser acquired the brewery. And in 1861, Adolphus Busch married Lily Anheuser, of course, Eberhard's daughter, and later began working for him. In 1869, Adolphus was full partner in the brewery, and he served as the company's secretary until the death of his father-in-law in 1880, and that's when he became president. In 1880, Anheuser-Busch was really nothing more than a local brewer. Adolphus really did everything that he could to make Anheuser-Busch grow from this very small local brewery to the global giant that it is today. There were really five factors that led to our enormous growth and made us more than a local brewer. Those are, of course, pasteurization, artificial refrigeration, refrigerated rail cars, rail side ice houses, and advertising and marketing. And I'll tell you guys a little bit more about each one of those. The first factor that I mentioned was the use of pasteurization. Adolphus really responded very quickly to advances in science and technology, and he and Louis Pasteur were actually friends. And so when Louis Pasteur started to conduct all those experiments on fermentation in beer and wine in the 1870s, Adolphus played pretty close attention to it. And we embraced this idea and really became the first US brewer to start pasteurizing beer in the 1870s. The new technology really allowed beer to be brewed on a larger scale and bottled, um, and of course started um, allowing it to be shipped long distances without it going bad. Pasteurization really made it practical to start bottling beer on a larger scale, which is very important to our industry and how we grew. The second factor that I mentioned was the use of artificial refrigeration. Artificial refrigeration is something that's very simple by our standards today. We go to the refrigerator and open it up and get out any cold beverage that we want. 
But artificial refrigeration was something that really revolutionized the brewing industry. <clears throat> brewing really was a seasonal business in the United States and was confined to the colder winter months. But artificial refrigeration really changed all that. Stock houses could be built above ground, and we didn't have to rely on the size of the caves that were available to us. Adolphus took a huge risk by adopting artificial refrigeration systems for Anheuser-Busch in the 1880s. We no longer had to rely on the size of the caves that we had, and the investment really proved um, to be very simple, very economic, and reliable. So now that we had all this really great beer in these stock houses, we wanted to get it outside of the St. Louis area and started using the refrigerated rail car. These were first introduced at the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, and by 1877, Anheuser-Busch was using more than 40 cars built by the Tiffany Refrigerator Car Company of Chicago. Adolphus and three other businessmen later established the St. Louis Refrigerator Car Company, and they, established, um, and they provided us with a fleet of over 850 cars that could transport our beers throughout the nation, um, and of course, uh, to the coast where it could then be shipped internationally. In those hot summer months, that ice isn't going to last very long, no matter how cold you, you try to make it. Um, so we had to come up with this very coordinated system of rail-side ice houses. And these were built all along the railroad tracks and really provided us a great opportunity to get beer outside of the St. Louis area. Um, along those tracks, you'll be able to find, if you're ever studying the history of the railroads in the United States, you might see some of these buildings are still in existence. They're not owned by Anheuser-Busch, but they're a great reminder of those early days of refrigeration and how we were able to really start transporting our beers um, throughout the world. The last factor that I mentioned to you is the use of advertising and marketing. And of course, brewers are really saturating the market with advertising and marketing, and of course, Anheuser-Busch was no exception. The company carefully created an image of quality and then aggressively protected that image. Um, by 1897, Anheuser-Busch had more than 17 different brands of beer on the market, and that's why I like to show this tray from our collection from that time period, because each one of those cherubs is holding a different brand of our beers. By 1901, Anheuser-Busch had hit the one million barrel mark in, in terms of production and sales. One of those brands that was in production was a brand called Faust Beer. Tony Faust and Adolphus Bush were really good friends. And Tony owned a very popular oyster house in St. Louis, and of course Adolphus would eat there frequently. Uh, their friendship grew into a brand of beer. In 1884, um, Adolphus decided to help out his friend and create this really great new dark lager beer, and it could be served in his restaurant. Well, of course, the beer was named Faust. So the news of the brand, of course, expanded outside of the St. Louis area. Visitors came and ate at this very popular restaurant, and they really enjoyed the beer. And so ultimately, um, Faust Beer became our number three beer brand outside of uh, Budweiser and Michelob. So it was something that really expanded um, definitely from the popularity of the restaurant and, of course, the great taste of the beer. So when nationwide prohibition took effect um, on, in 1920, Anheuser-Busch was unable to produce our primary product. We tried more than 25 different products like baker's yeast, ginger ale, um, ice cream, and of course, near beers. And so after those very th uh, 13 very long, dry years of prohibition, um, it, it was of course repealed and Anheuser-Busch was back in business. In 1933, we went back to our three primary brands, Michelob, Budweiser, and Faust. And Faust was actually in production all throughout the 1940s, and it was ultimately discontinued in the 1940s to make way um, for our other two brands of beer that were a little bit more popular, Michelob and, and uh, Budweiser. So as the craft and specialty beer movement in the United States really started to take shape in the 1990s, Anheuser-Busch really started to expand outside of its core brands. Um, Faust was, of course, a natural selection. Uh, the recipe was resurrected from the archives, and Brewmaster started to work tirelessly on brewing the beer again. The ideas were so well received that an entire line of beers called the American Originals were launched from recipes that were stored in the archives. Uh, those brands were available to, um, to people all throughout the United States through the mid to late 1990s. Most recently, our brewmasters visited the archives again and took a closer look at the Faust brand. Since it was so popular in St. Louis, they decided to brew the beer again and make it available in our St. Louis Beer Garden and other taverns that are available in the St. Louis area. 
We had a lot of really great response to this very local brand, and it really helped create a great relationship between the archives and the brewing department. So it was a great way to really bring that, that local story back um, yet again. Well, that was our local example. Now let's talk a little bit about our global icon, Budweiser. Budweiser was introduced by Anheuser-Busch in 1876 in St. Louis, Missouri. The first bottle was a clear embossed bottle. The image that I'm showing here is our first paper label that was in use in the 1880s. Um, Anheuser-Busch was in charge of brewing the liquid, but a man named Carl Conrad was in charge of the bottling for us. Um, I think there's some really re interesting uh, elements of this label that I'd like to point out. Of course, you can see that the label is written in German, and there's a Habsburg Eagle in the upper right-hand corner of the label. You guys remember what I said about the population of St. Louis in the 1800s. That's definitely felt when you take a look at the Budweiser label. Also of interest is in the center, the crest um, of the label around the stylized hop blossom. When Budweiser was first introduced, it was a local brand, but Anheuser-Busch really wanted to expand outside of the St. Louis area. We had a lot of competitors, so we wanted to get outside the St. Louis area and really make it more than a local brand and make it an international brand. I'm very happy to say they were able to do that. We have price books in our collection that show Budweiser was available in places like Yokohama, Japan and Paris, France by the early 1900s. Well, how were they able to do that? By using those innovations that I talked about earlier. And Adolphus was a great marketer. He spearheaded the company and used tactics to get his name and the Budweiser name in as many places as he possibly could. This beautiful sign in our collection is a great example of how the company provided various options for consumers. You no longer needed to travel down to the tavern to get a pint of beer. You could actually go down um, and actually take a bottle of beer home for home consumption. This is really important when you start um, thinking about the prohibition movement and all the um, anti-saloon you know, saloon league and all those things that were happening in the United States. Um, but in order to get into these bottles of beer at home, you had to find a way to get into these cork top bottles. So Anheuser-Busch started um, purchasing these pocket knives and putting their names on them. Some of them simply said Anheuser-Busch, some of them said Budweiser, and others said Adolphus Busch. All of them contained a small Stanhope lens, and if you ever have an opportunity to see one of these pocket knives in person, you'll hold the uh, pocket knife up to the light, and you'll look through the little hole, and inside is a picture of Adolphus Bush. This was a great calling card for him. Instead of passing out business cards, he passed out these great pocket knives. They were very utilitarian, could get into those bottles of beer at home, and it was also a great reminder of what he looked like. If you saw this guy in a bar, you wanted to go up to him and get a free bottle of beer, so it's very important. We have all these really wonderful pieces on our collection, like this beautiful reverse painting on glass, and each piece actually tells a story. There's gold leafing, there's exquisite framing, all done on a sign that really advertise our beers and were meant to hang in bars and taverns. If the company's spending this much money on its advertising pieces, just imagine what it's doing with the liquid that it's actually advertising. We're really able to show these pieces to brand team members and agency partners and get them really excited about our story and about Anheuser-Busch. When the Budweiser brand came to us in, the 19, uh, in 2015, they really wanted to refresh its packaging. So we're able to pull out all these bottles from our collection and really provide a comprehensive look at the more than 140 years of the Budweiser brand and its packaging. At really quick glance, the label hasn't changed that much, and that's something that's definitely very apparent. It uh, goes from a script font to a block font. It's pretty iconic for those reasons. Well, here's what the brand looked like in 2015. It has a very nice script font with gold accents, but the brand team and the agency really wanted to get a little bit closer to the brand um, and try to clear out some of the clutter that had been added to the label um, through the years. So the agency really focused pretty heavily on our 1933 bottle. They preferred the simplicity of the font and the label was used for their inspiration. This is the design that they came up with. Total conversion of all packaging in the United States took place in 2016. Those design elements were continued all throughout other packaging offerings like cans um, and aluminum bottles. Budweiser has grown into the world's most valuable beer brand and is enjoyed in more than 85 countries today with two of every three Budweiser's being consumed outside of the United States. 
In 2016, the brand grew revenue by 2.8%, experiencing double or triple digit growth in most top 20 countries. And I'd like to say it's because of the work we did on the label. So I, I try to say that. I can say that in this audience, but oftentimes other people just laugh. Um, each of those Budweiser's enjoyed all across the world have a bit of history attached with them. The use of the archives can really be seen on every single package, and it really does inspire a great deal of the marketing, including the current tagline that's in use, This Bud's For You. And on the back table, we've got some uh, Budweiser bottle openers that you guys are welcome to take home with you as a souvenir. Um, and today, I hope that I provided you with a, a quick local example and a global example of how our archives has used um, in our company's everyday life. And I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you a little bit more about the department itself, the structure where we fall, and where I see us going in the future. So the archives department has actually been part of the company since the 1940s. Um, when it was originally founded, it was actually part of the legal department. Um, and later, it was moved to administrative services, whatever that meant, um, and then public relations. And today, we actually fall under the marketing department. And I think that's really the best fit. Um, we have a small staff of three people, and we're physically located in the United States in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, we have about 17,000 artifacts, last time we counted. We have hundreds of thousands of photographs and countless documents that really uh, span throughout the company's history from the 1860s to the present. We do actively collect material, um, and we do our best to capture those new electronic formats that we all talk about. Um, a, recent, a recent addition to our collecting scope really includes television commercial elements, which we can help brand teams now use to come up with new creative by using existing materials. I think it's really exciting to use that archives model, using something old to create something new um, and with something that's so, so current and um, part of our everyday marketing. Our collection, like most people in the room, is not open to the general public. We do um, answer questions from consumers on a daily basis. How much is this beer can worth? When did it date from? Those kinds of questions that we get every day. Um, but we do have a museum that we just opened about a year ago um, in St. Louis, Missouri. And it provides visitors the opportunity to see many of our favorite pieces um, and really learn the story and the history of Anheuser-Busch. If you find yourself in St. Louis, please feel free to give me a call. I'd love to make sure that you're able to um, visit our museum. It's definitely an experience that you don't want to miss. Anheuser-Busch is, really is a really wonderful company that embraces its history. I hope that you were able to learn something new about our company or perhaps an example of how you might be able to use your company's history in a similar way. I'm really proud to serve as the company's chief storytelling officer and use our historical collection to connect with consumers on a daily basis. Okay, so I think we have a few minutes for questions. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much. Yeah. And I'll kick off with one question, because sure. most of us here are called archivists or uh, <laughs> records managers, but your title is actually chief storyteller. Yes. How did that come about? Yeah, so it was, it was part of a discussion that I was having with my boss one day, and you know, we were talking about collections and how, you know, how people use their collections. And the, the conversation started with, you know, a lot of people that have collections are just hoarders, right? We're all just hoarders if we don't do anything with the collection. So instead, you know, instead of, you know, people thinking, oh, the archives is just a, a collection that sits and we're hoarding the material, not showing it to anybody. Instead, we're really able to interpret and talk about the stories that each piece really tells us. And that's what really interested me in history in the very first place. You know, I was interested in history and did my undergraduate in it, but my parents said, what are you going to do with a degree in history? Um, and I always thought that objects really do speak to you. You know, they tell you about the person that actually owned it. It actually tells you about that time period. So I think it's important um, that we should all call ourselves chief storytelling officers because I think it's something that, you know, we're not hoarders, right? We're actually wanting to share these collections and be able to tell people the great stories about our collection. So thanks for asking. Thank you. <laughs> Tim? Excellent presentation. Uh, could you uh, tell us the story then of how you uh, dealt with uh, your namesake in the Czech Republic? 
Yeah, that's a great story. So that's really why the Archives was founded. One of the reasons um, the Archives was founded um, from a trademark lawsuit. And so there's uh, definitely trademark lawsuits that happen continuously about um, a lot of our different brands. And there is still a continuing lawsuit um, that happens um, all throughout the world in terms of our Budweiser trademark. So, um, you know, we're consistently in, in battles with um, you know, all over the world fighting for various trademarks um, and specifically the Budweiser brand. So that's something that um, is of great value in terms of, uh, you know, legal information, um, being able to house that in the archives collection. So, um, yeah, it's something that we, we continue to fight on a daily basis. So it's a good question. One question back there. So you started your presentation showing that commercial that was shown during mm -hmm. the Super Bowl that had a very strong heritage component. Was your department involved with that commercial at all? Yeah, thanks for asking. Yes, we were. So, um, you know, they start the, the Super Bowl is a really big deal uh, in the United States. And definitely we spend a lot of money as a company on, on uh, working on creative um, so probably about four months before the Super Bowl aired, it was definitely an idea that was, was pitched to us, and it came from one of the agencies that had spent four days with us in the archives, and they got really excited about the stories that we were telling. So, you know, we, we went through the company's history and talked about our founders, um, and they, they pretty much took it from there. Um, they did the commercial not as a documentary, but you know, more as a, a fun, you know, storytelling piece. So it's not, um, you know, it's not a, not meant to be a documentary, but it's a really great capture um, of, of our company's history. Thank you so much, yeah, Tracy, for no this. Problem. Thanks again.